Quoth the Raven, Nevermore. What's that? Quoth the Raven, Nevermore. Who wrote that? Oh, that's uh, Edgar Allan Poe. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of. Yeah. Okay. <sighs> Are we ready to start now? It was a dark and stormy afternoon. Uh, that it is. Patreons, hi, it's Kevin. Um, you know him. <laughs> yeah, the one that forgot the lighting kit. So, uh, literally, pardon, pardon the <coughs> harsh lighting. Um, yeah, we, we basically the light bar that he never installed, the 52-inch light bar, is now is currently sitting on a ladder, zip-tied with a deep cycle marine battery with some wires taped to it. It's fine. Would you believe an LED shop light sitting on a ladder? <laughs> I was half right. That's. It is actually an LED shop light sitting on a ladder trying to light us, and we've been fighting with it for the last... 30 minutes yeah trying to cut down on you know these shadows like the one over there at scott and you know uh i can actually see your doppelganger behind you <laughs> giving myself bunny ears oh well, you could do that too there's a lampshade right behind you that'd work as well and where does a hat um you know, so uh, <laughs> yes, it's a little harsh, but uh, we were doing really well on natural light, and then Florida decided to be Florida, and our five o'clock uh, evening thunderstorm rolled in at three. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, uh, it got on dark, and the camera's going. Is there anybody out there? Yeah. Welcome to OTT After Dark. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Excuse me. All right. Well, I suppose you are recording. Yes. Yes, I am recording. I did boop. I, I did want to make sure. Um, so we better get started on the show. Are you doing the intro or am I doing the yeah, intro? Yeah, I'll start the intro. Hopefully, Uh-oh, I remember here most we of go, it. Folks. Yeah, <laughs> taking bets now, and how about I screw it up? Hey, Jeepers! Welcome to another episode of On the Trail with Kevin Scott. Kevin and Scott. I don't know. It's show 100. I'm allowed to make things wrong. As Kevin said, this make is our... Make things wrong. This is our centennial show, you said? Well, yeah, it's 100th. Yeah, it's 100th. Yeah, so uh, anyways, while that is being said in my mind as I'm trying to grasp with the idea of moving forward with the conversation, I am Scott, the slapstick parts guy. And sitting directly across from me is... Yeah, and out of slapping reach, <laughs> I'm Kevin, the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that can be remedied. Uh, I, I am the engineer, you know, the guy who uh, typically reads the instructions, uses the correct tools, and follows them, and does remember on my intro lines. <laughs> hey, while we will share what works for us and what it didn't, it's always up to you to do your research, read the instructions, and of course... Please follow them. Hey, at least I got that part right. You did, and that's the important part. <laughs> took you 100 episodes. <clears throat> well, it took you 100 episodes. Folks, I'm still sitting here just absolutely stunned that almost exactly four years ago... Yeah, to the day. To the day, we released Show, show one. one. Yeah. And... Boy, it's horrible to listen to right now. <laughs> For me, yeah. that is. You may find it humorous to go, oh, hey, so that's what they sounded like yeah. in the beginning. <laughs> and as you progressively listen to each show episode, you go, wow, they got progressively better and better and better and better. You know, that's one of the things we get is, hey, I just checked out your show and I just didn't listen to your first show. You guys the same people? <laughs> yeah, we are. We are. Yes. Um, so at, 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 at 100 shows. Yeah. That's pretty just. Uh, blows my mind. Yeah, that and and where you, our listeners, and our patreons have driven us to in terms of the stats. Um, Again, thank you very much. Thank you very very much. Uh, let's see, iTunes. We're in the top twenty. Yeah, of all automotive, not yeah. just Jeep automotive, automotive. podcasts, uh, and it just. You know, that's not us. That's you guys listening to us that drives those numbers. So thank you very, very much. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is deeply appreciated. Um, you know, a- as we hit our 100th show, Scott, let's kind of go back and, and talk a little bit about what is On the Trail with Kevin and Scott and what were kind of our founding principles. Yeah, I guess a lot of people have asked, you know, hey, you know, we've heard the stories about what you guys used to do, but, you know, what really, what, what was the driving passion behind it, I guess you could well, say. Well, I was going to say, <clears throat> let's start off with the basics. Okay. This is our listener show. Yeah. Our content is driven by emails, you know, text messages, <laughs> even cheesy memes from <laughs> you, our listeners, and our Patreons. You know, you, you guys ask questions, ask, uh, have ideas, make suggestions, and we take that and try and turn a show out of it. Yeah. Uh, we've always said, although we haven't repeated it probably in the last mm, year, uh, 18 months, this is your show, each and every listener, yeah. uh, and uh, not really ours. Uh, I could go on at length about lots of 
totally useless, <laughs> boring subjects. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, no, no, I, I got to pump the brakes on that. Some okay. of the subjects you do know that's inside that noggin of yours is some really interesting and really cool stuff, like, you know, the stained glass stuff. Yeah. You know, different things you've done, you know. And it's just like everyone says, you know, hey, can, can you guys, have you guys ever thought about doing this or that? I'm like, yeah, Kevin did it. <laughs> well, how, what about putting a V8 in your Jeep? Well, Kevin did it in someone else's Jeep. <laughs> yeah, I didn't do it in mine because yeah. uh, mm-hmm. if, if you go back a couple of years to the show discussions on when I was making a decision about slightly altered, um, back then I was running the uh, stock four liter. Mm-hmm. And it was, hmm. Do I do a diesel conversion? I was looking very hard at Cummins was coming out with that repower system. The 2.8. Mm-hmm, the 2.8. Uh, could I go with a, you know, uh, a V8 conversion? I actually got really, really, really close to a, to a Hemi conversion. Right. Down to the point that I found out that the engine and transmission combo that I was looking at was the unreliable period in their manufacture yeah. and i was like yeah no i'm not buying somebody else's troubles and putting it in my jeep i have enough troubles with my jeep as it is just being a jeep <clears throat> and you know ultimately the show will tell you that i came to the conclusion that uh for what i do with my jeep mm-hmm. um simple at a black head and some intake and exhaust modifications and a little bit of tweaking on some tuning some alien spacecraft technology too well, i don't know about that but you know any, any tj that can lift a tire off the ground making a left turn, you know, that's got enough torque. I don't need enough to rev the engine and roll over on its back. The know? Kevin edition, the NASCAR one. Left turn, we'll go up. Well, you know, it has something to do with suspension and engine and torque. <laughs> well, and that's the thing, too, is like not every situation calls for a repower. No, you know? it, it really doesn't. So, But anyway, Scott, you're carrying on. That, you know, folks, we have tried to follow what you guys have asked us to follow. <clears throat> and uh, if we're not doing it ourselves, we'll go find someone who does. Yeah. So, you know, if you want to hear about repowers, well, we'll go out and find some folks that have done it and are willing to share their stories. You know, we've talked yeah. a little bit about uh, Red Scorpion Fabworks and the custom cj7 with the uh, yep. six liter ls you know Con, uh, also, also known as a yeehaw <laughs> it is definitely a yeehaw jeep um we've taken you stories about uh um specialty powder coating yeah bonnie, bonnie. and kenny and god's jeep yep. that is still and it is god's jeep take two now no, it's actually like type 7.0. Well, technically, yeah. yes. But yeah. since we've done it, yeah, uh, it's, type two. I just saw the uh, the videos where they took it up to Hard Rock for some, some yeehaw moments, and, <laughs> and we're having a great time with it. But we're also as much interested in the people who are out there with the four angry squirrels mm-hmm. who are just trying to, well, can, can I can I run 35s? You know, this is, <laughs> this, I'm glad you brought this up because, you know, Kevin and I kind of freeform shows a lot. And, you know, yes, just like, you know, me forgetting the lighting kit. <laughs> <laughs> the best laid plans go when you don't want them to. <laughs> but one of the things I talked to, and I actually, I man, I'm so glad you brought this up because okay. it's what I wanted to bring up. Well, it's just uh, our history. This yeah, yeah. is where we come from. A, 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 a person on a Facebook group mm-hmm. said, you know, hey, I got a four cylinder YJ, 180,000 miles, and it's puking oil out of the dipstick. And I have, uh, the, it's puking oil out of the oil, uh, the air filter. Right. And I said, yep, been there, done that. And he's like, really? Well, what, what, what did you do? And I said, well, here's what I did. You know, because he's like, you know, do I do a repower? What do I do? I said, hold on. You know, what are the symptoms you have? Well, I want to do a diesel flush and all this kind of stuff. I said, okay, just do this. Clean up that elbow, you mm-hmm. know, the PCV elbow. Get yourself some nice, good oil. You know, I'd suggest like 30 weight, a decent brand, and two cans of eight cylinder engine restore. Okay. And he's like, what? And I said, change your oil and use two cans of eight cylinder. Because you got blow by. Yeah, you've you know, got you, a lot of blue. You, you pull that uh, um, uh, oil filter cap, it's going to go, ooh. Yep. Ask me how I know. <laughs> and I, I, everyone, I refer this to as the YJ black lung disease. Mm-hmm. You know, because, again, air filter is just caked in oil. Yep. Well, sure enough, he poured two cans of oil, did what, uh, uh, two eight-cylinder. He goes, well, it's still a little bit of blow-by. I mean, it, well, there is still a lot of blow-by, but I have a little more power. Because mm-hmm. it's sealing the rings a little bit better. And he goes, you know, I, I'm only killing half the mosquitoes I was when I was driving down I was going to say, you still got to be leaving a blue smoke trail <laughs> oh, behind you. <laughs> he was. But but the idea is, that I said, look, this may get you another 10,000 miles to All save right. money for another vehicle well, or another uh, engine. Well, what should I do? Should I do, a, should I do a, a inline six repower? If you're going to go through all that trouble, bud, just do a V8. You know? So, See, when, I... I I understand that. I just I threw the four cylinder in with with the with the yeah. the punch thirty over and the forty eight gears. Mm-hmm. And, and 
you need to look at how you're going to use a Jeep. This goes right back to our founding motto, you know, do your research, decide what you want to do to your Jeep. Yeah. And we did several shows on that topic about, you know, everybody's in love with the V8 swaps. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, I'm not against them. I've done them. I've sorted out the wiring, which is a nightmare. Um, but do you want it and do you need it? Yeah. Um, everybody I've talked to with a high-end V8 loves it, but they admit that the handling is radically different. Yeah. The torque steer is phenomenal. The chassis twist, the you know, most of them, oh, well, you know, I had to result to a full-body cage. You know, if you want to see a V8 build done really right, you look at God's Jeep. Because Kenny is a skilled mechanic and fabricator, fabricator, and he took care of the torque problem by looking holistically at it. And the 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 roll cage is actually also a body stiffener or frame stiffener, yeah. and so the the chassis can take it. But you're also still in a short wheelbase vehicle. Right. Um, here's a little fun fact you can Google. But if you look at the one of the most famous overpowered small vehicles out there, the Shelby Cobra. Yeah. It's an AC Cobra originally mm-hmm. designed with a four-cylinder, upgraded to a straight six. Then Carroll Shelby brought the AC body over to the U.S., built a two a ch- tube chassis for it. Most mm-hmm. of them, you, most people don't know, it's it's basically built on two four-inch pieces of steel pipe, <laughs> and yep. everything's welded on it. Um, with a 289, that's the model that went out and won all of the road course races. Yeah. The 429 side oiler powered Cobras had so much power that they were twisting the frames. They were okay on a drag strip, but if you actually got on the power coming out of a curve, you couldn't turn. It'd just drive it straight off the track. Yeah. So, you know, you have to ask yourself, do I have the power I need? And too much power can be a problem. Now, I realize that may be sacrilegious to some folks. Yeah. But you have to realize that power does you no good if you can't plant it. Right. And if it doesn't plant and becomes unstable, then it's just a good way to hurt yourself. But yeah. I'll get off my soapbox. Um, well, no, you're right, because, again, we always talk about finding your weakest link, mm-hmm. you know, and that's one of the co- more comments I had, because I can hear everyone typing now going, you know, Scott, you needed it, you know, yeah. 10 to 35 V8, no. No, no, no. That's why I kind of steered more towards, you know, repower with the force owner. You know, again, are you the guy only drove the Jeep for fun? Yeah, yeah it wasn't a daily driver. I'm like, within well, a four cylinder, as long as you're not going to go down the highway, he goes, Oh, no, I got a trailer for it. Well, then just redo the four cylinder. You'll go a lot further cheaper. while all your V8 friends are sitting there going, Anybody got a jerry can with some fuel in it? <laughs> well, and not only just that, you can still wheel with what you have and not worry about it. Like everyone else is melting down because another comment was made about how I guess now the JLs, I haven't done any research on this mm-hmm. yet, so I'm going to, moving forward, my next show, I'll have more research. I guess the JL now is coming out with the Dana 35 again? I had not heard that. It's like a it's a it's a redone Dana thirty five. Again, I'm going to do my research on. It. I'm yeah. just using this as, as a as a as a product point. But everyone's saying, you know, well, you know that that that, that the, the, it, it's terrible that the lowest price point Jeep comes out with terrible parts. Well, you just answered your own question. Well, you know, and here's what I'm going to say is, they're probably very good parts if they're left the way the manufacturer put them in there bingo lollipop uh you know we've we've had this discussion before everybody calls the dana 35 the 35 and it's Mm -hmm. you know what if you keep the 29 inch tall tires that are only 10 inches wide on it and you don't put a v8 on top of it and you drive it to get somewhere and not to see if you can break something it actually will do a really good job on the other hand if you're out there to to try and do King of the Hammers, yeah, it's probably not the most suitable axle no, out it's there. Not. <laughs> well, and that's the thing we talked about. Like we talked about that uh, gentleman, the older gentleman with the flatty fender. Yep. You know what I mean? Four cylinder, just having the good old time. You know, that's the to, devil's crack, and and yeah. just. You know, that, that's guts. That's guts and skill. You can't really fall through. Well, well I guess you could if you fell out of the Jeep, but, well, still, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's guts to go, I'm going to do this and skilled enough to go, okay. And, and that, that, that guy did everything I would love to do in a Jeep that was twice as old as me. Of course, I just realized something, Scott. What's that? We just went through the first year of the podcast in about. 10 minutes <laughs> well you know and that's and that's one of the things because i guess it's like again i love freeform shows because yeah. again people ask again 
like you know where'd you where'd you where'd i'm gonna you, put again on the quarter jar i know just like you know like absolutely, absolutely. go ahead <laughs> That's 50 cents you owe me now. <laughs> yeah, really. That's the worst part. But one of the things that kind of came up at work mm-hmm. the other day, and you know, we were talking about vehicles. A, a young gentleman called up and wanted a, uh, he had a, a 2JZE motor and needed a, a GFXE fuel pump that's two inches taller. On a, He had a 2000, or sorry, a 94 SC400 with a super motor in it with a, and I said, okay, but parts don't work that way. You know, you, you, well, you know, I know what I'm doing. You're an idiot. Yeah, and walked away. And I, I, one of the guys next to me goes, you know, Scott, how much, where did you learn to do all the stuff that you did? Because we are always talking about TJ, YJ. As much as you complain, you get alphabet souped. You just alphabet souped him, mm-hmm. and you alphabet soup us. I'm like, you know, that's a good point. You know, and then it kind of dawned on me. Here's this person in this garage building what their dream is and making mistakes, you know. So that got me thinking, you know, where did I come from? You know, what started me on my path to automotive knowledge? And I can remember my first, when I wasn't, I was like my fourth car by then because I never changed oil on the ones before. But um, I wanted to do a lowering kit on my 85 Azuzu Pup. So I go out there and I asked friends and I lowered the torsion bars with a craftsman hand hand tool set I had, and you know didn't put the one spring spacer back or keeper back in there. So I eventually started sacking down again. But I remember with a scissor jack. I, I, I told Kevin this, this story before this, and Kevin's skin's crawling. But mm-hmm. I used a scissor jack to lift the axle entire vehicle up, so I could get the lowering block underneath it to hand tools. No torque wrench, hand tools with a you know what seven inch long handle <laughs> to torque my U bolts back down on my rear end. You know, are, are, so. That's so if I you do. ever saw the little Isuzu pup on one side of the road and the axle <laughs> bouncing down the other side, you know it was Scott. <laughs> and the sad thing is, is a financial my side of the financial department is sitting here, and she probably remembers that truck and goes, you know, really? <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things is that, again... I learned by making mistakes, yeah. you know, and that's how I rolled up my sleeves and, and I made a lot of mistakes and that's how I learned. I can't argue with that. I mean, I made my fair share. I mean, I can still remember being 10 years old, helping my dad put in a, one of those lovely little three dial, three dial gauge sets right. on a 1968 Pontiac Firebird. Don't tell me you left the engine oil. It was a mechanical oil, the engine oil thing kind of loose and sprayed no, engine oil no, inside. No, it was. I was supposedly tightening up the fasteners to the amp gauge. Right now, that's not the Volter gauge that is used now, but amperage, which meant you took the battery lead into the gauge and then out from there to the, not to the engine, but all the other devices. Right. <clears throat> um, and as I'm tightening, I did not realize that the battery was still connected and wrench. On nut turning, contacts floor with the uh, assembly back, and needless to say, I attempted to arc weld the gauge to the floor pan. <laughs> um, managed to <clears throat> knock it off. My dad shouting at me to get out of the way, get out of the way, get out of the way, and I grabbed a tool and I knocked, you know, grabbed a, a wooden handled hammer and used the handle to knock the, the wrench loose. Right. And we looked at it, and there was no hole through the floor. There was probably an extra dimple of metal that shouldn't have been there, and the crescent wrench was no longer longer a crescent but more of a l uh, you know but overall no damage done and you know i still remember my dad sitting down and doing a post-mortem with me and what went wrong and why did it go wrong and he wasn't blaming he just said yeah. this is the way an engineer deals with these situations you know and basically and and i know you're gonna have to beep this out but s happens no, no. i don't have to read that out that's okay, okay. s happens so you got to learn to deal with it. And right. so that was my, not my first experience with a vehicle, but that was kind of my initiation by fire. Uh, you know, the same thing when you, you give a, a young boy uh, the shotgun to shoot for the first time. Yeah. And you're standing there ready to pick him up off the ground. <laughs> because, you know, he's he's got that all the... shoulder's going to hurt. Uh-huh. You know, <laughs> and you, you can teach and you can teach and you can teach. But until you bust your knuckles, get knocked flat on your back a time or two, um, hopefully it's not a Murphy's Law situation. And yeah. that's why I stress, you know, you should learn from others' mistakes. Mm-hmm. Um, I still remember the most graphic um, situation was actually a... TV show it was made up there was an old TV show in the 70s called emergency I remember that you remember that one? I remember that the two paramedics yep there was a situation that they went in on um, 
where a guy had been working on a car on a jack and the jack had collapsed and their response was getting him out he was alive until they put the weight off of him and the release of the pressure allowed the and the story was you know all the blood vessels that had been ruptured or broken and things were compressed it's kind of like you know when you when you uh, accidentally tear a hose and you put your thumb over the hole as long as you keep pressure <laughs> yeah and you know long story short of course they saved you and all that stuff like that but i can still remember going and asking my parents was that a real situation because it seemed a rather far-fetched you know, far-fetched to me and my dad was absolute and he my, my father at that time retired 26 year veteran of the air force mechanics um was a maintenance squadron commander working then for a steel company one of the major steel companies says yeah it's very real uh and more serious than you think and i think that was one of those that kind of a young psyche got me in that okay you can work fast you can work safe but you know what if you really think it through first you can work fast safely and that's why i push it so much and of course my whole career ended up that way <laughs> um so no nah, you know and, and as far as jeeps you know you talk about you start with an isuzu pup i started with oh good lord tractors and old ih pickup trucks um uh international harvester for those who are wondering corn binder yeah as a nickname of them but yes one of my neighbors and had one of those uh, we had a uh, Chevy C10 pickup that my dad kept popping the motor on. He was convinced <laughs> that the C10. That. <laughs> yeah. And I got to the point I could swap out a small block Chevy in that truck in about three hours flat solo. Yeah, uh, it's like doing the Volkswagen motors, three wires and four, four bolts. bolts. <laughs> and knowing the right way to hold your mouth when you scooched it forward so it would clear the apron pan yeah. <laughs> and drop down. It's funny you talked about like you know taking the um, the battery off uh, the, when you uh, learning by mistakes. Mm-hmm. See, sometimes mistakes you got to make twice. Like when we did the clutch and slightly altered, you know, we in a big hurry raised it up. Gets, Not slightly to, altered. Or sorry, um, it's an automatic quantum quantum get, entanglement. Got, 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 got done. Get ready to take the starter off. We've got to pull the starter, the the battery. Yeah. You know, so of course on a ladder, you mm-hmm. know, we're we're taking the battery off. I'm helping a friend uh, with his truck the other day, and <laughs> get in a hurry, lift up the truck. Okay, we found the uh, the crankshaft position sensor is behind the starter. Got to take the starter the off. truck's on the lift. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, oh, great. Great. Get a yeah. ladder. <laughs> well, you know, it's uh, it, it's kind of an interesting thing. So, you know, I guess the point here, folks, is that Scott and I came by a lot of this with the hard knocks and the, mm-hmm. and the bruises, and I've got lots of little decorative scars on the hands. Oh, yeah, like the first time I did my uh, YJ transmission, it took me 16 hours. Mm. The second time I did it, it took me 13. <laughs> the fourth time I did it, it took me 8. Well, you know, I actually was, my dad um, and I learned to do mechanics together. You know, he actually was trained as an officer to lead mechanics. But, you know, when when we, uh, when he retired back in 1968, long before you were conceived and concerned and, you know, (laughs) thought in your father's eye and uh, worry in your mother's mind. (laughs) Moving on. (laughs) Yes. Uh, But, uh, you know, he started working on things. And um, there were four of us, but he kind of grabbed me by the scruff of the neck and said, you might as well learn to do something useful. (laughs) (laughs) And so, uh, uh, actually, it started before that. We had an old... um, Pontiac Le Mans, the two-door sports version, when we were living down in Albany, Georgia, yeah, and learned how to do um, uh, oil changes on that and overhaul an engine in the backyard kind of concept. And I was, I really was, I was a young kid working on Grandma's car, which was a '54 Chevy, yeah, a Tri Five, you know, '54, '55. I'm sorry, it's '54, right before the five, six, and sevens, right. Uh, but it was a neat old car. There wasn't much that could go wrong with it, you know. And, uh, you know, I, I started turning wrenches young. And I, when my dad retired and we moved up to Pennsylvania and he worked for Pittsburgh, Des Moines for years and then decided to buy the farm out in western uh, Washington County as his retirement uh, home, he and my mom. And he brought me home a present one day with an ulterior motive. Really? And he said, I, I looked out, and I was like, I thought you were going to go buy a tractor. And he said, I did. Well, is it being delivered? He said, no, it's in the back of the truck. <laughs> Some assembly required. 
It was a 56 Farmall Cub, which is a flat fender, uh, I'm sorry, a flat head, four-cylinder, gas-powered tractor. Um, so your dad got it from a Kia? <laughs> No, but a flat pack I, I, that would have come with instructions. This was just literally two wicker baskets full of parts. You know, the front bolster, the transmission, the rear drive. Where's bolt pack 4A? Where is bolt <laughs> pack 4A? Yeah, no, this was... <laughs> and I remember him going off and I said, so you got a manual with it? And he's like, um, no. No, it's an automatic. Uh, or, or no, there was definitely a manual's yeah. manual. <laughs> okay, right foot pedal onto this, left foot pedal onto that, center foot pedal onto what? Yeah, that's right. It's yeah. three pedals, you know. And he's like, look, it's pretty straightforward. You know, we ought to be able to figure it out. He said, I'm taking the engine block in and having it machined to try and, you know, I think the thing had maybe 15 horsepower. <laughs> trying to get sad some... it's easier and cheaper to get a horse <laughs> it probably was no i had a great time with my dad we we basically laid it out and we figured out how it went together by laying the big parts that we knew okay the rear tires at the rear and that's uh, a big one right yeah uh, and, and the little ones is the front tire so we're gonna put them up front and, and that's a radiator so that's going up front and, and that's what we knew right you know and that's the kind of stuff we knew and we started filling in between you know right. and this one was had had a center section with a hydraulic motor in it that you know so it had one a built-in hydraulic ram so it's like okay now it wasn't hosed and everything it was all inside the case and you just had these arms that came out that had 90 degree cranks on the side that would lift implements with a rod going to the back for the uh, three-point hitch <laughs> and it was wild but on the other hand there's something about taking a stack of pieces and setting your butt on a stool or actually in my case it was a an old trash can upside down you know yeah. and, and going okay i don't know where this goes let's go look for this bolt pattern in some other piece and see if we can match yeah. up bolt patterns and then once you matched up bolt patterns you couldn't just grab any bolt and run it down you had to grab a bolt run it in did it bottom out no okay how thick's what i'm bolting yeah so you did a piece by piece by piece and it took us probably two or three months of tweaking but the first time that we fired that thing off although i will i will back a little bit that was also my introduction to magnetos oh um and for those of you that know what a magneto is which mm -hmm. is a ignition system that requires no coil it's got its coil its trigger its points everything's internal it's used yep. on aircraft engines because it's high reliability yep and provides a wicked butt busting spark there you go you don't have to you know delete yeah, that thank one. you um without any um electrical battery source at all including it long quite powerful enough to jump out of the cap and come around to whatever is holding it screwdriver you're holding next to it no well it was me holding the unit turning the crank at the end and with my dad going you should not a <laughs> he didn't get any further what did we learn electricity hurts <laughs> I mean, it bit me and bit me bad. <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, the guy I was helping unplugging this uh, three-phase plug. Yeah. And my, my dad looked over. He says, well, at least we know the magneto works. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you got, like, the young Einstein hair. Do you going on? It's all smoking. And you're going, meep, meep. Yeah, meep, meep, meep. <laughs> Pretty close. But, you know, it's still really neat to pull, pull the starter ring on that thing and... and you know, have it roll, roar to life. And the little flathead four-cylinder four engine has its own unique little... <laughs> Did you have an inertia ring on the flywheel? No. No? Okay. Inertia ring? You just had a massive round chunk of cast iron. <clears throat> the outer edge had teeth in it for the starter, and okay. the rest of it was probably 26 <clears throat> pounds of cast iron. You know, it, it, it's little things I throw out like that, you know, when I talk about jobber pricing and the people yep. all around me go, how long have you been doing this? Yeah. A nursery ring? Come on, Scott. It ain't the 50s anymore. Yeah. I'm, no, this was predating that kind of stuff. This yeah. was brute force engineering yeah uh combined with if you're not sure if it's strong enough make it thicker or bigger or heavier yeah um and when, when i left home well in fact when my parents sold the farm and decided to move to sunny florida for retirement take 
four or five or six, <laughs> whatever it was. Um, you know, oh, it, huh, it's been your money. Exactly. So uh, it went with the farm, and it was still running, still pushing snow in the winter, still pulling a single bottom plow or a cultivator or you know whatever he wanted. You know, and the and the it was a strong little engine that made me really, and that probably was the foundation of my respect for any displacement engine. If it's strong enough to do what it needs, you know, a big old V8. I've actually seen people that have converted not um, not a Cub, but a Farmall A by putting a flathead V8 in it. <clears throat> and really? it really doesn't work any better. Hmm. You know, the, the, the original four-cylinder, you know, that was in a, the A model still you know chugs right along. chugs right along so you know and then of course you can get the ages and the super i'll go into that for hours it's i love old farm equipment <clears throat> but for me you know um the jeep bug bit me bad yeah uh about um time i was due to graduate from high school about 76 yeah the bicentennial year right. uh red white and blue everything uh, including the jeeps yeah. You know, they had the red, white, and blue Freedom Edition with denim the interiors denim too. interiors and the Levi buttons on the seats. I wanted one so bad, so very, very bad. Yeah, and, 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 and you got it. one, right? No, I didn't. <laughs> what did you get instead there, Kevin? Uh, Ford Falcon. <laughs> Uh, 1970 and a half. It was the last year before the Falcon became the Torino, uh, you know, the body style change. But it did. The fun thing about the Falcon, before we leave that, is when I got the vehicle from my dad, it was a 300 straight six C3 automatic transmission four door Ford Falcon. Right. When I left. <clears throat> my last time to go to college for my last year, and my dad said, "Hey, uh, you need to, before you go. Can you help me move the stuff out of your bedroom?" Um, and, and he was going to sell the car for me. When he sold that car, it was still a blue four door with a Boss three hundred two, a Muncie four speed, a nine inch <laughs> rear end, <laughs> and no air conditioning, no power steering, just an alternator, and was quite capable of blowing doors off of just about anything because unlike everybody else at that time who was jacking up doing the bigger uh, n- near slicks shall we call them the dot legal slicks on the back and the skinnies up front and the drag style right i was an early adopter of the nascar the the car had been set balanced lowered a slight bit in the front raised a little in the rear uh, 70 series all the way around no fancy rims and sway bars cannibalized off of mustangs up front and i forget what it was in the rear something else in the junkyard <coughs> excuse me and uh bringing nostalgia back yeah it would uh it would corner like it was on rails and it would beep and get <laughs> <laughs> well that's uh, that's the cool that we talk about like our past and all that and speaking of past like yep. you talk about your, your ford falcon is that you know like we know ford brought back the bronco obviously yep you know and get a big contender for the jeep but that is not and everyone, I got a diatribe because it's on my notes. And again, I'm glad you did this because, one, I can do a joke, and two, everything else. Ford missed a golden opportunity. Oh, Lord. They should have brought back that nameplate back in 2000 because you can have the Millennium Falcon. But no, seriously, um, we talk about the whole jokes with like the, the Bronco coming you mm-hmm. know, and all that. And, you know, Jeep people are kind of concerned. Two things I want to th- a handful of things. Why are they concerned? I don't get it. Well, people are like not really concerned. Some people are excited. It's a polarizing subject. Yeah. I mean, again, we yeah. talked about we it talked before. About it on we, the last show. We, we think it's great, but the the cool thing is like you know, is it going to be like you know, so the, the Jeep wave is going to be the Bronco kick? You know, <laughs> sorry, hey, Denver. You know, <laughs> real Broncos have leaf springs. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, real Broncos have V8s, not a six cylinder turbo. You know, I can just see all the the, the pages now and all the forums. But again, this is the first time Jeep's been challenged. Can you remember the vehicle that came out in 2005, 2006, I think it was, that challenged Jeep? A major automotive manufacturer went after Jeep right about the same time the four-door was was released. Not off the top of my head. It's got the flapping penguin, I call it. Toyota. Little flapping penguin, I call it. No. Oh, the FJ Cruiser. Oh, they released the FJ Cruiser right just before the four door came out. Now the FJ Cruiser's got a serious, serious following. You know yeah, what it I mean? does, and, and it we is. almost bought one for my daughter because it's it is a Toyota, so reliability, mm-hmm. and it is a 
Big box, you know. And Big box, and they went after the four wheel drive market, mm-hmm. and it sold about twenty five thousand units a year. Yep, except for two thousand eight, two thousand, you know, when the downturn happened. But it never really was the Jeep killer they were hoping it would be. And that's my thing is that even when the first Forerunners came out and the first pickups, and I had one of the little Toyotas for a while there. Yeah, and it's a great vehicle, but it wasn't a Jeep, and, and because. And that's the thing I, I kind of look at people who get worried. I'm like, there is a legacy to the seven slot grill. Yes. There is a legacy to that nameplate. There is a legacy. Now, <clears throat> there are times I wonder if Chrysler isn't pushing the legacy more than the vehicle because, you know, <laughs> eventually you can destroy a legacy. Yes. <clears throat> Well, one of the things they talk Excuse about, me, and the, the things that they, they release for the salesmen, everyone see them online. Talk about the Jeep's forward fi- or the the, the uh, folding forward windshield. But have you? When was the last time you saw a windshield down? Exactly. Now I, I I have seen them at a several of our off road events where people have done that. The last one was that was held was uh, Jeeping with Judd, and I did see quite a few folks that were like, "My windshield falls down. Dang it! I'm going to fold it down." Yeah. Until the first round of dusty tray. <laughs> <laughs> and then suddenly they were back up again. Uh, <laughs> Those bats in the Delphi are crunchy, if you know what I mean. Yeah. But, uh, no, it, it's it's kind of a, I guess I'm not worried. I, I welcome it because yeah. competition drives innovation. <clears throat> and we covered yep. all this in the last show. Um, you might get that two-door uh, Gladiator. You could. You could. The key is, if you want it, you got to buy it. Because if you don't buy it, they ain't going to make it. Right. You know, if you don't express the interest. Um, yeah. And... Uh, you know, nobody, any uh, Chrysler, Ford, Chevy, General Motors, whoever you want, a Toyota, yeah. Nissan, could have expected the Jeep to explode. You know, and let's be honest, it's not the fastest. It's not the prettiest. It's really not even the most trail capable. And I know that's hearsay to some people, but if you've ever watched a UMOG from uh, Mercedes, you know. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I and it's what's funny. People, well, that's a purpose built military vehicle. Not really. So was the Jeep in a way. So was the Jeep. Yeah. Um, but you know, none of them have the history. None yeah. of them can you, you. You can look back. I can look at my TJ, which is almost an antique now. That's a horrible thought. Uh, generation generationally, it is yeah. <clears throat> removed, but not quite past the twenty years. Um, but um, it will be soon. <laughs> Five years, we mean you get that blue plate. Yeah, we could. Um, but, uh, you know, I can still see D Day in my TJ. Yeah. You can still see D Day in your Gladiator. Mm-hmm. Okay. Ford made a really good volley because yeah. I can see the U100, but the U100 itself, the original Bronco, that mm-hmm. was the model number, was U100 for those that don't know the history. Um, it was chasing a Jeep. Yeah. That's why Ford brought it out, was that they wanted the Jeep, because they manufactured a vast number of the quote-unquote willies, you right. know. Uh, and, uh, and not everyone's Parnelli Jones. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for those that don't know, that was Big Ollie, uh, which was a U100 that ran the Baja and just beat up. You know Jeevers out of everybody else. Thank you for making me uh, have to, uh, to bleep half the stuff uh, the show. We're back into my history of the yeah. stuff I followed as a kid um, and a young mm-hmm. adult. I loved that stuff. But my first Jeep didn't come along until one of my jobs uh, was doing work in Washington, D.C. with the Corps of Engineers. was a, a young engineer, and I had a job doing this neat little project, uh, standing in the Potomac River up to my... <clears throat> freezing because unfortunately an aircraft a few years prior had attempted to take off not survived uh plunked into the potomac river after playing ping pong off of the 14th street bridge and everybody knows it is air florida the air florida crash and i was part of the team that went in and changed the runway overruns what's that got to do with jeeps you may ask well they didn't have any vehicles to give me except a very old, dilapidated CJ5. Get out, Betsy. Dust her off. Ten top. Yeah. 
some of the old jeepers will know what i say a ten top <laughs> yeah um snapple cap and it was painted black with a white you know ten top and it was an old what they called civil works jeep back when the Corps used to well they still do a lot of civil works but we had a separate cadre that did that and they're like well the shop won't work on it anymore but if you need a vehicle if you can get it running you can use it so that was my first CJ5. I'd only wanted one for a decade prior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh, gee. <laughs> and you got your Wrangler edition. Oh, wait. Yeah, uh huh. <laughs> the, the denim seats. Oh, wait, that was a jacket. No, you were this was, this was, yeah. This was a. <laughs> I know. I'm not even sure they were anything other than canvas covered seats. Yeah. Yes, the gas tank was under my butt. You know, you flipped your driver's seat forward to fill the. <laughs> Get out the cosmoline soaked top. Oh, it was, it, you know, but I will tell you what. I took those doors. When that was back when the Corps of Engineers logo was a meatball, we called it. It was a round logo. And the doors had the big meatballs on them. And I, I would be driving from um, the north part of Washington, D.C., Del Carlia Reservoir, which is way up there at the northern point uh, of the actual District of Columbia, down to the airport and back and forth, and it was through Georgetown. And I'd take the doors off in the summer, and I'd be wheeling myself with one foot outside the door. You know, I just, oh, I was in heaven. Or that bell-bottle pants just a flopping? No, that was after the bell-bottom pants <laughs> okay. quite a bit. Uh, no, oh, they, yeah. they were... This is the members-only jacket days, right? Yeah, but uh, that wasn't even me then. That was blue <laughs> jeans, work boots, and then the the uh, uh, denim Corps of Engineers jacket that I had. Because <laughs> I was making the joke about the denim jacket. The heater didn't work. <clears throat> there well, was no air conditioning other yeah, than was, two doors. <laughs> and uh, but you know, here I am driving through the middle of Washington D.C. with the uh, the Porsches and the Corvettes and you know the ladies standing on the corners and all that kind of stuff in that part of Washington, D.C. It's like, and I'm driving there in this big old and the top, you know, if the if the uh, piece of foam popped out between the roll bar and the top, every time you hit a bump, it yeah, yeah, this is an apple cat. <laughs> so that that was my intro to Jeeps, and yeah. that was it. I was hooked. You yeah. know, it was everything that 16-year-old had dreamed of and wanted. Yeah, it was dirty. Yeah, it leaked. Yeah, it marked its part spot more than the Harley that my, my uh, co-worker drove to work every day. He used to laugh. He hey, says, that's my spot. Oh, wait, hold on. It's in the wrong spot. No, no, that, yeah, that's the big puddle. That's mine. Yeah. Um, I didn't get to take it home at night, but, uh, you know, that that cemented it. And well, then, What's the old joke? You check the fluid. Yep, puddle of each. Yep, puddle of each. Hey, you, you fix your Jeep and I haven't got a puddle. Oh, crap, i got to go get oil. Yeah, <laughs> it needs oil. <laughs> hey, you, can tell, you, you can tell when the Jeep needs oil for three reasons. One, it's ticking. Two, and the, uh, <laughs> it, doesn't leave, it doesn't leave a mark. And three, you haven't checked that in a couple of days. Yeah. So, but how about you? Where did you get your first Jeep fix? Uh, pretty much uh, when I was playing with G.I. Joes. And uh, and uh, speaking of G.I. Joes, were you okay if I give a quick shout-out to a, po- a, a YouTuber? Sure. Uh, um, again, he it, it does he re reuse old G.I. Joe toys. Um uh, HCC 788. Um, he does reviews old toys from my childhood. And mm-hmm. You talking about the year ch- going back, and it reminds me of playing with Jeeps, and then that's where I got my Jeep fix. You know that whole thing, and I, I thought it'd be a really cool idea to, you know, again, I always wanted one, and mm-hmm. it wasn't until I got my. Again, I always wanted one. I always wanted a Wrangler, and similar to you when your dad brought home the tractor, my stepdad goes, "Hey, I brought you a Jeep." Really? Yeah, cool. Let me come see it. And it was the Gladiator, or at the time, the um, not the Gladiator, but the uh, Comanche. Uh-huh. I'm like, oh. You know what I mean? Had I known then what I know now, I would have kept the stupid thing. <laughs> well, but, you know, when, when Sue and I first got married, we needed another car. The first thing I did is I went down to the AMC dealer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, I think it was already Chrysler AMC. AMC Plymouth. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> we went and... They actually, it was outside Philadelphia, on the, right on the, the city lines, and they didn't have a Wrangler. And so the guy was taking me over, showing me the Cherokees. And in my budget, he was trying to put me in a four-cylinder manual uh, Cherokee, which was fine. And, I mean, I was seriously considering it, and we took it for a test drive. And I said, well, I need to pull in the parking lot and do one test. And the guy's like, well, what's that? I said, nothing is going to hurt it. He's like, well, okay. And I turned the AC on high. Um, the wipers on. Uh, you turn the headlights on, and from a dead stop, turn the wheel to a hard lock, turn to one side. But <laughs> it, it, that little four cylinder just could not handle the auxiliary loads, much less try and move the the Jeep. Yeah. 
And at that point in time, I kind of had to say, well, until I can get what I want. <laughs> yeah. So, but uh, then we, we actually, it wasn't long after that when we were in Washington, D.C., that my wife needed a new vehicle, and we ended up getting her a Grand Cherokee. And it was the 94, first year out. And for those of you who do wheel the ZJs, you know that underneath it is... A TJ. Yeah. Uh, same front axle, same front suspension. It's got rear leaves, same transmission, same four liter engine, but it's just got plush upholstery on the inside and a, yeah. and a rear bench seat that you can actually get in and out of. So, uh, Without, as you put it from our first show, sawing the kid's legs off. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, expediency. But Sorry, Timmy. I only want to buy a TJ. That's a real Jeep. <laughs> yeah. So, and, you know, it, it's, was it lasted us all the way till we got here in florida and um there was only a short time between that and the tj so you know i come by it kind of honestly and it's been tempered with experience from a whole raft and i'm not going to list the 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 plethora of other vehicles that have yeah i have wrenched on and and you know overhauled engines or rebuilt engines or replaced or repowered or you know fix this fix that i will make one shout out comment um and that is that all I have to do, and if you guys want to watch a really neat video, uh, a, a series, um, Eric O uh, up in. Uh, <laughs> That's where I made the the, uh, the judo chop reference. Judo chop reference. Episode. Eric O runs South Main Automotive yeah. up in New York. And he does publish a YouTube channel, and he is really one of the best at showing you how to do the deductive reasoning particularly on electrical. He's a, he's a character, too. He, he is a character. But I watch his videos, and I go, you know what? It's hot. It's wet down here in Florida. It can get miserably hot. But I'm not working on rust cake. Salted you, vehicle. All salted be- You watch him, and he'll sit there, and he'll use, you know, uh, Big Nasty, which is an air hammer, right. uh, to push out, you know, a shock bolt. And it just rains rust. <laughs> You know, around him. And I go, I remember that. I worked on New York vehicles, Pennsylvania vehicles, Northern Virginia, Maryland, Ohio, West Virginia. And the Rust Belt. Oh, you know, I can remember trying to drive a bolt out and looking back and realize the bolt, the bracket, everything came off in one big piece. Yeah. And then you're like, okay, cue how Kevin learned to weld. <laughs> See previous statement about a, what it, the dust in your head. Yeah. So, but, uh, you know, and then going into college and engineering and starting off in mechanical. Um, I really thought that was where I belong because I really love things mechanical, um, you know, the electrical, the systems, how they operate, how they interplay with each other. Um, it wasn't until four years in that I went, this is neat, but this really isn't what I want to do for a living. Yeah. Um, and that's when I went back for two more years, <laughs> changing my major, dropping basically my last two years of mechanical engineering. Uh, fortunately, made enough to qualify on paper, at least, for a minor in mechanical. But right. um, And got myself a degree in civil. Uh, because while working on Jeeps and other vehicles is fun, it just really wasn't big scale enough for me. Yeah. Um, and for those that, you know, I'm not going to go into my job history, but every career for me, just it was one progression after another of bigger programs, bigger projects, leading up to helping to rebuild a country. Yeah. You well, know, and, so. and then that's the thing where, where we talk about, like, you know, what led us to where we are, you know. Mm-hmm. I knew that, you know, my the uh, hopes and dreams and aspirations of fixing things you know led me to you know get a roll up my sleeves and you know sometimes i had to fix things because i had to do it and i thought well you know there's a way i can do it i can give back a little to the community and that's when we started the podcast mm. you know and, and, and kevin loves to teach you yeah. know every time we do one of these off-road classes you know i just realized that the first time i was teaching it was what's called the free U course or free university course mm-hmm. at my college uh my branch campus of my college and i'm uh, realizing it was 40 years plus ago that yeah. i was teaching you know that was me ago yeah that was a <laughs> that was that was scott ago uh you know people how to change a tire 
adjust brakes, change oils, change air filters. You know, not you do not need to put that oil filter on, sir, with the wrench. <laughs> you know, it was funny. We're sitting there one day at work, and someone got, I guess, got out their big blue hammer or whatever, and he went, and I go, man, that guy's trying to get that drain plug really tight. Oh. And my co-neighbor, my neighbor next to me goes, no, man, he's getting the oil filter on really tight. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, God. I'm the only joking. Uh, no, but again, it's... it's. I like, wish you were. Yeah. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> what we're going to say now, words. <laughs> but um, hey, speaking of saying words and about the fact you like to teach and all that, uh, I think we take a, uh, I think it's going to be a slick idea if we take a quick break. Sure. Because uh, we're going to come right back to a really cool garage segment because... Uh, I read something on the internet which led to another conversation. I'm like, hold that thought, Kevin. we got to talk about it on the show. So we'll be right back. Hey, guys. Don't forget to check out the uh, On the Trail podcast page, uh, onthetrailpodcast.com. You can see Kevin and I, again, have a face for radio. And not to mention the uh, 4x4, uh, 4x4 Radio Network. Dot com mm-hmm. and again for all the really cool shows and again as always our patreon page when I become a patreon come on down we'd really appreciate it you know and then uh, you know help out the show and we can grow and grow and grow and grow and get bigger and you know the neat thing on our patreon page you can see that we do have some corporate patreons yep and you know what if you're interested in work um, basically when they become our patreons we usually check them out a little bit and so most of them will yeah we, we, we think they do a pretty dang good job in fact most of them have been on the show. So if you want to find out how folks, you know, are, you can, you know, check out uh, uh, Jeep Lab. You can check out uh, Red Scorpion Fabworks. You can check out uh, Wrangler Fix. You can mm-hmm. check out all kinds of the different. Um, even the clubs. Even the clubs, you know, we've done a, usually done an interview with them, you know. Yep. Well, it's like we did with Ox Locker. Mm-hmm. Rock the Ox. There you so go. Uh, anyhow. Well, we're going to get right back to this uh, uh, show. And, again, thank you for 100 episodes and all you patrons. Thank you very much. Yes. So, Kevin, as it always talks about on the interwebs, quick question, because I kind of know the answer. Um, Only because we talked about it before we started recording. They're not supposed to know how it works behind the scenes. So, anyways. Um, <clears throat> you're the one who always says, let's do a pull back the curtain show. Yeah, well, expose, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> Wait a minute. Uh, anyways, so, basically... Uh, from my old school days, mm-hmm. I knew like you know WD forty was you know water displacement series forty or tri forty or whatever yeah, you want to talk formula about formula forty yeah. formula forty. And I've seen you know tricks where people spray you know the engine gets wet you know go through a water fording you go ahead and hit the microphone with your hand um, spray the cap you know with some WD forty put the cap back on now. And I've actually seen that <laughs> trick go wrong. And that's when Kevin says wait at least eleven Mississippis. <laughs> yeah. I'm like oh yeah he's got a point there. Dry that out because it is a flammable propellant and I have seen at least one personal experience with one person doing that and going oh snap snap my mother. shouldn't you bang <laughs> bam and the radi- and the uh, um, rotor and cap are put in low earth orbit uh, <laughs> don't have one of those in your trail bag do you <laughs> Hey, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to put phenolic back together. It doesn't glue well. <laughs> you know, it's like the whole, like, you know, keeping stuff in your trail bag. You know, well, my friend's got a spare towel. I'll use his. You ain't using my spare tire, pal. <laughs> yeah. But anywho, um, so anyways, uh, water displacement, WD-40. Again, it's not me official, guys. Sorry mm-hmm. to break it. The internet's wrong. Go figure. But, um, you know, waterproofing ideas. You know, you know elect- someone said you can do it, use it on electrical connectors. And I'm like, eh, no, no. Why can't I tag Kevin in this Facebook page? <laughs> And you said you're, you're a couple of you. Uh, it's a question that gets asked frequently, and, and you wanted to re up the information. So, yep. WD forty. Can you use it as electrical insulator? It's not an insulator. It's an oil. Okay, and it's a. It's really an oil designed to displace water. Mm-hmm. And yes, if you have wet electrical systems that are shorted out, you can attempt to spray them down. Um, and hopefully it will displace enough water. Most of the places I've seen it used is is on electrical, uh, you know, spark plug wires and around the coil packs. In the old days, it was the coil. Yeah. Um, still, if you do anything and, and look at it, they do recommend that you spray it, dry it, wipe it off, and let it flash off before you try and uh, right. use it again. <clears throat> the downside to any petroleum product is it may have adverse effects to plastics and rubbers such as used in insulations or connectors. You may find that while it worked, it may 
kind of solidify the crud in the connection that you can't get it off next time. Mm-hmm. So I would say yes. When I have to use it for what it was originally designed for, WD-40, as a displacer, I will take apart a wet connection, spray with the water, you know, to remove it, and then shake it or dry it off. I'd love it if I had compressed air, in which case I wouldn't even need the WD-40. Right. And then reconnect. <clears throat> But it's got a lot of uses. I mean, it is a petroleum product with a lubricant in it, so I've seen people use it very successfully as a safer method for starting diesels than ether. Because right. ether is a solvent, and while it's very flammable and will fire off a diesel with nary a, a rotation of the crankshaft, it also washes the oil off of the cylinder walls yeah. and really ex- exacerbates wear. Uh, but And WD-40 is not quite as explosive as that. Now, the older formulas may have worked better that used propane as a propellant, you know, because then you're just doing propane injection. <laughs> Make it faster. Right. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of different <clears throat> tricks for different um Let's call it garage chemicals. So keeping things, keeping water out of electrical connectors, your standby still maintains the good old-fashioned just butter lard, right? <laughs> no. Um, what he's referring to, folks, is I told him I wanted to revisit a topic that was in one of our very earliest shows, and it keeps coming back. It's kind of like that bad dream that you just can't shake. It's kind of <clears> that bad electrical connection that keeps happening. Yeah. And that is the argument over dielectric grease. Yeah. Okay. It's like, uh, what lifts do I run on my 35s? So yeah. Coming back. <laughs> um, folks, dielectric grease is a great product. Um, but the fact is, I see people, I put it um, inside my electrical connectors. And I can't tell you that that's 100% wrong, but what I'm going to try and do is explain to you so that you can judge, is this the right time to use it or not? And then I'll give you some safer guidelines. Um, Number one, it is dielectric. Uh, And people are like, well, it still conducts electricity. No, it doesn't. All right. If you go, and I'm sitting here with one of the more well-known brands, Permatex's data sheet. And it says, breakdown voltage of grease per a specification. It's 1,100 volts per mil of thickness. Okay. That is not conductive. And let me make the point very clear. If you are one of those folks who takes a six-pin connector, or let's say you're you're ECM and you flood coat the area and you shove that connector in there, if it was conductive, you'd short out all those pins. Right. All right. It's not conductive. Now, there are greases that we know of that are called conductive greases. They're not really, but they call them that. And you know one of them very well. And it comes in two varieties, silver and copper. Oh, I thought you were going to say like strawberry and lanolin. Uh, no, no, nope. <laughs> Sorry, kiwi. Kiwi. Uh, and that would be uh, anti seize Yeah. Now, the truth is there's enough grease that the little particles of aluminum in the silver and little particles of copper in the, in the copper-colored ones can't really conduct either. But the metal's in there for a different reason. <clears throat> The key is, what makes dielectric grease special is the fact that it's 100% silicon-based grease. There is no... (coughs) Sorry, folks. It is... We've had so much rain here. Everything is growing and repollinating and budding, and I have some... I, I, I'm sorry. I, the, the pollen aspect. I, I'm a North Carolina boy yeah. who, who's now in Florida, and, and I was not used to these here plants. The pollen <laughs> outlook on the news says apocalyptic. Yeah, pretty much. Um, Wait, a pollen up? Oh, good Lord. And so what it's good for is the silicon formulations are not injurious. They won't chew up plastics or rubbers for the most case. So O-rings, snap connectors, electrical wiring insulation, spark plug boots, it's safe to use on them. Right. Um, it can be used on the connectors because its viscosity is such that when you push the connectors together for metal-to-metal contact, it basically will move out of the way for the most part. Yeah. The downside, and here's the catch that gets a lot of people in trouble. A lot of the newer connectors, uh, I'll go with one brand that I'm very familiar with, Weatherpack. Right. Okay. And, um, well, I can't even think of the other names right now. But a lot of those are very, very small pins, tight tolerances, and they rely on the spring tension of copper. 
which is you know you can bend copper pretty easily um yeah so they're made to be dry contact pins you know between the center pin and the and the sleeve part and when you pack it full of grease like what i've seen people do just you know like i used to do yeah more is better and then you push that connector together you actually put more grease in there than there's room for and what does that do that takes the sleeve portion and spreads it right now you may have contact for a while and you may not you know it may be completely isolated and insulated or it may in other words you can do physical damage by hydraulic pressure yeah you're you're almost hydrolocking your your connector you are and that's why you know i have always recommended that Clean the connector with contact cleaner that removes corrosion, and right. then keep the silicon, you know, the, the dielectric grease, on the sealing surfaces, okay, not on the electrical contacts, you know, and that way they slide together. The seal, you know, think about when we put gaskets, you know, we want them to slip when we're tightening them to equalize pressure. That's why we do, uh, when you do a head, you don't do in a circle and bunch up the gasket. You start right. in the middle and work way out. So having that lubrication on the sealing surface, and if you need to look inside a connector on a Chrysler, it's always all, almost always on the one that has the little lock in the pop tab, yeah. and you look up in there, and you'll see the center heart, which has got all the pins in it, and you'll see a delta, I mean, a different colored rubber gasket or vinyl gasket around that and then the outer shell that, that physically protects it. That's a great place for dielectric yeah, grease. that's what you taught me is around the gasket, basically. And that will allow the gasket to move and seat as you lock the thing down, and then it provides outstanding moisture protection. You know, if you're missing the little rubber seals on the butt sides of the connector, by all means, you know, dielectric grease kind of from the back side to keep water out. It's a wonderful idea. It moves. It'll, it, you know, it'll absorb the wire vibration without a problem. Right. Um, Having said that, I can't tell you that putting it on the contacts is bad. Inherently, it's not. And the older contacts that were loose fit and oftentimes had a spring to help make the contact, you know, stay tight, um, they would just, the stuff would squish out and it would surround the pins and the tubes and the clips and the slides. And you it know, almost made it like a hermetically sealed. And it made it a hermetically sealed joint. Uh, the classic one where dielectric grease was, and it probably got the the idea that everybody should put it everywhere, is the old spade and sleeve connectors. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, the light bulbs too is what they told us to do. Yeah. Uh, well, light bulbs go in with a, used to go in with a turn and a twist right. and that would squeegee the material off okay. now there's one place i will be blunt about yeah I can use it on the boot and should of a plug and coil but don't put it up on the high voltage connections the reason being <clears throat> when exposed to high voltages and arcs like in a spark uh, for an ignition system, you know, particularly when now what are we up to? 60, 80,000 volts yeah. of electricity. Uh, silicon carburizes. And quite frankly, when you have an excess of silicon and it carburizes under an electric arc, you get something called silicon carbide. Yeah. That same abrasive that's used for, you know, shot blasting, your sanding belts. <laughs> yeah. Compression uh, shorts. Yeah. Oh. Ow. <laughs> that's, the, that's the Chafe brand. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, you know, you can actually... Every time I go jogging, I smell fire. I mean, I didn't realize that till I looked up from another friend of mine, and this is probably 15 years in the past. Yeah. Um, he had actually coated a rotor and figured that the rotor spinning inside a distributor cap would benefit from this since it was conductive, right? Well, no. And if you've ever seen a clear, one of the advertisements with a clear rotor cap and seeing a rotor spinning inside there as an engine is running, what you see is literally Johnny Cash song, a ring of fire. Mm -hmm. You know, the arc is so continuous, even though you can't see it, it does only go to one post at a time, but there's a trailing voltage behind it. And so it's a firestorm in there. That's why it's a closed in solid insulated cap. And I guess it created enough silicon carbide. We couldn't figure out what had happened because it eroded the entire tip off and it core-holed the little spring center cap. 
wow. you know, from the grinding. And that was because, and I found it in a report online that that was what has happened with, with uh, the silicon. Um, it's a it's a great product. Please, um, this is not in the least bit negative on it. It's just use it the way the manufacturers intended you to use it, and you'll have some fantastic results. I keep the stuff around constantly. It's a great lubricant, not just for electrical connectors. Just because it says dielectric, that just is good news for you. You got squeaky plastic parts that rub together. Yep. It's a great lubricant for squeaky plastic parts. It's it's overall a very benign lubricant. It's typically clear to just slightly opaque, so it doesn't really leave the little uh, lithium grease was good, but that leaves little white fingerprints everywhere. It, it almost reminds me of zipper lube. Guess what? It's probably the same stuff. It's the same stuff. Oh. Charges you more in a smaller tube. <laughs> Although Way to go. a lot of zipper lubes are basically thickened Vaseline, which is a petroleum. So you run a risk there of staining and, and that kind of stuff. But it's a great lube. Um, and again, for those of you that are using it successfully inside battery terminals between the post and the uh, and the clamp, more power to you. I don't recommend it. Coating the outside of a connection after it's been made, I'm all for it. That's a great way to seal yeah. the connector. You know, liberal, eh, most part, judicious use is probably better than liberal. But, you know, let's be honest, most things that way. If, if a little's good, a lot's usually not better. Yeah. Um, so that's just an old one. We did cover that on a show quite some time ago. But, you know, since it keeps coming up, we thought that just might be a really good, uh, you know, reminder for folks that mm -hmm. use the stuff for what it was intended. <laughs> well, that's another thing, too. I'd like to, on our next show, 101, beside the Dalmatians, I would like to um, bring up... Uh, the TSB on the Gladiator. Okay. If you have any luck with the TSB, apparently there's a TSB that just got released. I, the wife kind of found it a little bit. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of knew a little bit about it where the, the Gladiators have been, and JLs have been doing to wander on the highway, kind of yep. like what the, the old Jeep was doing. Like your old JK was yep. doing, which you have that steering gearbox with that overlong shaft that just... Mm -hmm. Kind of fatigued. <laughs> yeah, and and so I guess there's a TSB. So I'm gonna do some more research about that because yeah. you know our gladiator kind of gets a little wandery every now and then. So I'm like, which surprises me with the long wheelbase. It should be very stable. Yeah. Well, again, we're we're gonna check in, and look into it a little bit. I'll, I'll, if you have any experience with that, I'll take a look. Yeah. Well, I say if you do personally, mm -hmm. email the show on the trail podcast. Oh, at oh gmail. listeners, oh. I see you. Yeah. Sorry. He's staring at me when he says that and pointing his finger at me. And I'm you know what? The patrons anywhere. that see us on video will confirm that he was doing that. Yeah, the patrons right now are going, "Whoa, man." It's OTT after dark. <laughs> it was a dark and stormy night. We were in the garage. We're in my studio. But yeah, that's know, fine. That's the garage is right over there. Exactly. It really is there, guys. It's it's, it's literally on the other side of the you wall. On the other side of where you're, yeah, you're past the ladder holding the shop light to the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm so bad. I'm sorry, guys. That's fine. Both I remember the, fourth the microphone. Wall. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and now I'm going to have to when the, when we end the shows, I'm going to have to turn the camera on before I turn it off, just so they get a face glare of what we're trying to work with here. <laughs> I'd take a picture, but it should be a giant white dot. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, anywho, I really think we've probably taken the hundredth show places that it never intended, no. just like our jeeps. Exactly. <laughs> but uh, yeah, again, uh, we we enjoy to do this, and, and yeah. we're we're going to keep doing this. As the one uh, reviewer left, you know, please keep putting out great content. We have every every intention to. And but I'm going to ask each and every one of the listeners, Patreon and otherwise, is how. Oh. Give us some contract content. We some are contracts and no, content. Some content. Content. I realized I was about ready to eat the microphone cover. I'm sorry. I figured you know that would be a little gross. Uh, <laughs> that's Scott's finger. Like a giant marshmallow, <laughs> except it's a little over toasted. <laughs> that's the stop, drop, roll brand. Yes, uh, they're, they're they're charcoal colored. <laughs> exactly. That's what your marshmallow looked like the last time we were out camping. <laughs> After I dropped it. <laughs> Moving on. So, so I think it's enough time. To, I, I, I think uh, time to lock up, put the Jeeps on the floor low, and hit the trail. And as always, don't forget to take pictures, memories, and your trash when you leave the trail. And keep it happy and clean for the next generation, because if we keep screwing it up, they're going to take it away. That's another show. That yeah, is. There's been a round of that here in Florida, but that's a sh topic for another show. As yeah, Scott said. And, and, and Kevin's kind of like, I brought that subject. I wanted Scott to go off on, but 
at the end, so I'm not going to go on it now. Thank you. That's the next one. So with that, uh, we're signing off. Have a wonderful time. Stay safe, everybody. Yep. Wear, you know, wear your mask. I guess is the proper etiquette. Although, you know, I, I, I like uh, right now we've got a distance between us, and we've got we have mask, we have microphones. So, yeah. um, cough into your sleeve. All the other fun stuff. You know, you you, you can look to the CDC. They they give you the. Uh, they seem to have finally got their head wrapped around this, and are giving reasonable. Remember, kids, use your sneezing elbow. Yes. All righty. Well, with that, it's time to wheel legal, tread lightly, and we'll see you on the next one. Bye now. Bye. Just in time, my battery was dying on my headphones. <laughs>